This evening. Uh, my name is Alan Kinsey, and I'm the executive director of the Min Flags One Campus Foundation. We're a nonprofit 501c3 organization here in the Mid Coast area that is dedicated to helping move the Mini Flags One Campus initiative forward. I'll talk to you about that a little bit about that in a few minutes. Uh, thanks for coming tonight, and uh, we had a good. Uh, I'm let you know too. We had a, a conference earlier today, right here in these rooms and upstairs as well, with about a hundred educators and administrators and curriculum development people and some board members from our area, which includes SAD 40, RSU 13, the Five Town CSD from Camden area, uh, the Region 8 Midco School of Technology District. We also have teachers coming in from Belfast, the Island Schools, and even down from Mount Desert Island. So uh, it was all about the subject of standards-based education. So we felt it was a very good day. A lot of good information was exchanged, practical information from the nuts and bolts teacher, how did you implement something like this level? So we were very happy as a foundation to be part of the sponsorship for that, for that day. On this evening, we will be uh, having some, uh, uh, Commissioner Bowen will be our, our keynote speaker this evening, and then we're going to have a panel who will also be coming up to talk about their experience with standards-based education in their communities, and we're also going to be having a question and answer session. Uh, Commissioner Bowen has agreed to remain around with our panel uh, after he's done, after they're done speaking to take questions and answers from the audience. And uh, we think it should be an interesting and uh, informative uh, evening for everyone. So we're glad you're, we're glad you're here. Um, a few things I want to point out as we get started. And I need to give a clicker. Mm -hmm. First of all, I want to say thank you to the, a group of folks who helped us put this together. Uh, we had a really active um, uh, conference planning and, and uh, forum planning committee that helped us organize this event and it was really made up of, of representatives from all of those districts that I just mentioned. So I want to say thank you to them. Uh, and two people in particular who helped us really organize this. Uh, Erica Mazeo, who's a volunteer with our Many Flags on Campus Foundation, who spent a lot of time pulling this together. And also, uh, she's, she's Christina Anderson Morehouse, also helped us organize with the keepers of organizing our daytime um, a conference and did an excellent job. It's a tremendous resource that she provided to us and helped us think through some of the issues that we're dealing with here this evening as well. Uh, finally, I want to say thank you to our two business sponsors who helped us put on this event this evening, Bank or Savings Bank and The First. Okay, I get a few minutes. Now, you know there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? I, I, get, to do, I get to do a couple things before we get to the meeting of the show. Uh, I am the director of the Many Flags on Campus Foundation, so I just want to give you a quickie update on where we are, what the Many Flags on Campus is, where we are with the process, and then I'll, they'll get on with the regular program. And it's a good way for me to kind of periodically in front of our community and let them know what we're doing. Uh, the, Many, the Many Flags on Campus uh, program uh, is a new model of fully integrated secondary and post-secondary education. It would be composed of a regional high school, which is our Oceanside High School, Career technical education, which is really offered here by the Mid Coast School of Technology, that's Region 8. A higher education center that would be comprised of classes and degrees and programs from the University of uh, the Maine Community College System and the University of Maine System. And that would really be Kennebec Valley Community College, would be our primary provider. And the University of Maine System would be the University of Maine Rockland, which is a uh, University of Maine Augusta affiliate, and the University of Maine Hutchinson Center, which is the University of Maine Orman affiliate. And we also have industry training centers. Our first uh, industry training center that would be committed to be a part of our, uh, our common campus would be the Marine Systems Training Center that would be administered by the uh, Maine Marine Trade Association, a private organization, a private sector industry organization that manages that industry sector. The special features of what many flags on campus would be is that it would have shared resources, obviously, by combining those resources folks that we just talked about onto one campus or to one area that we could actually share resources both virtually and, and on a real campus as well. That would help share resources and share costs and, and, and get great service at a lower cost. Each would have personal learning, personalized learning plans for each student as a hallmark of everything that they'd be doing in many flags. Every student would be working with a common group of, of counselors and advisors all across those areas that we talked about from high school, to post-secondary, career technical, and industry sectors as well. Project-based, hands-on, and applied learning is also another fundamental piece that as we talked about developing this model, that we think is essential to the learning, to the learning of, uh, that will happen at a robust uh, campus 
and robust programs such as many flights on campus. Early college and dual enrollment, once again, another fundamental piece of what this is about. Uh, clearly, one of the things uh, that we have to deal with in our area here is to increase our uh, access to post-secondary education for more of our students and more of our population in general. This is another way to do that. That's happening now, and this campus will help us in a way that we can make it even a deeper uh, and more uh, effective and uh, more students from the high school in particular taking advantage of early college and dual enrollment. Integrated academic and career technical programs. That's also an essential part. At the heart of what we're doing with the Many Flags uh, on Campus model is the career technical programming. Uh, and we really want to make sure that it's integrated. It's not something that's seen as separate from our traditional academic programming, but rather it's fully integrated into all the regular academic programming that we have for all of our students. And the final primary feature is industry-specific training. We mean by that, we mean industry training that's driven by the industry sector. The Marine, Trust, Marine Systems Training Program will be an example of that where the industry sector itself is responsible for bringing in the training, providing the training in a venue where we can bring together the students and adult learners to take advantage of that for, in this case, marine systems, which is a key uh, economic partner for our area. The history, uh, just to kind of bring you up to speed on where we are with this, this real quickly, is that we began looking at this as a regional economic development initiative about eight years ago now. Okay, actually it's about nine years ago now. It's been a while. Uh, we started doing that as we started looking at what are the key economic development <coughs> strategies that we need to move our region, the Smith Coast region, into the 21st century. And we realized, of course, that the one piece that was missing was a greater access to all levels of education, especially that post-secondary and technical education that allow us to really become transferring to a knowledge-based economy for the 21st century. In 2008, a state law was passed to create the, what is called the 9 through 16 Innovative One Campus Model. That's the one that kind of, the law that was put in place that allowed this process to go to the next step. Applications were submitted to the main department of education, uh, and in 2002, the final uh, scoring of those applications and ranking was done, and the many flags on campus application was ranked number one by the Department of Education. Um, uh, and that application was submitted, our application was submitted by a joint application by our Center team and Region 8, which is our current technical center region also with endorsements and MOUs from the University of Maine system and Maine Community College system. Uh, in 2011, a uh, funding line was added to the FY 2004 budget. That's where I stop and I tell Steve Bowen to put his hands over his head. That doesn't mean there's any money in that line, but there was a funding authority that was established. If the law that was passed in 2008 does require that once the that, that program was selected, that the department established this funding line, the, the department and the governor did that. It was included in the budget process. There is no actual real money in there yet. That's in the next biennium budget. That's possible, or not possible, as the case may be. But the point is that we do have that line. And that was a significant threshold for us to be able to reach that part where we're actually uh, fulfilling the obligations that was laid out in that 2008 law, systematically going through that process. By step by step by step. That's why it takes nine years. Uh, 2011, we also began, our foundation was formed and uh, we started beginning uh, getting some grant funding that would allow us to do what we're calling proof of concept pilot projects. We're also doing these forms as well. This is our second form. We plan to do two forms a year, one in the spring and one in the fall on issues uh, dealing with education in our area and education uh, excellence with the state of Maine. Uh, the other proof of concept kinds of projects that we're doing is, one is a dual curriculum, dual credit prototyping project that is really, con it's really working between Oceanside High School and our uh, Midco School of Technology to come up with a dual uh, crediting and curriculum process for math and science between those between academic schools and the current technical schools. So you can have dual credit. Another one that we just received uh, approval on from our school boards, all those boards I just mentioned, to go forward on is to do research on a common uh, schedule for all of those districts. And that's a big deal. That is a big, big deal. If we're going to really do this as many flags, we have to have a common schedule. So RSU, RSU 13, SAD 40, the Camden uh, Five Town CSD and Region A has agreed to at least take a look at and let us start developing some research to look at what are the obstacles and what could possibly be an answer to a common scheduling for those districts. And another one that we're getting ready to do, we hope to do possibly this summer, is to be looking at, a, once again, a regional, those same partners, a regional approach to curriculum mapping, uh, which really looks at how we look at all our develop our curriculums, compare them across the region so we can build a stronger regional approach to education for all of our students. Um, finally, the last thing that we're doing is, right now, we have, we have put together a steering committee. 
Uh, it's about 20 members from those districts that I just mentioned and our university partners and community college partners as well. And we're working on putting together the governance, ownership, and shared services policies that will need to be in place to make this thing run once it's ready to be put in place. Uh, and so we've been working on about a year. Uh, we're coming up uh, in about another month. We hope to have our draft done that will go back to those boards. Once again, these are just recommendations and our advisory board group. I'll go back to all the school boards and then to act on and vote on. We hope that by the end of summer, at least, we'll have those in place so we can put that on the shelf too. So we're lining up all the things that we need to be ready to go. So that's where we are. And uh, I guess that's the message I want to say is uh, we're here. We've been keeping our head down lately while we're doing our work, especially that last year, doing all that governance, ownership, and shared services grunt work and really pulling it together. But the question is no longer if many flags will become an innovative, replicable model for Maine, but when. Now, the when is a big question, and we understand that, but we want to make sure that you're aware of that. If you have any questions about any of the stuff, talk to me. Uh, you have my phone number, my website. Uh, you can go on the website, too, and see other board members who are there on the foundation. And talk to any of the school district or school board members, too. They know a lot about this from our area. So thank you for very much for letting me kind of give you that piece of update information on many flags. Now, I want to move on to the next part of our program. I'm going to invite Senator Director to come up and take over for you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I want to just offer a note of personal thanks, and I think thanks on behalf of all the audience here, to Alan for being the piston that has really driven the Many Flags project over this nine years. It's something that could have easily gone off the tracks a long while ago, but Alan's been relentless and positive and kept us moving forward, and for that I'm enormously grateful. I know Joan Welsh is here, the representative from uh, Rockport. Uh, Joan, I don't know if we've got any other legislators here, but I want to thank Joan for being here tonight. And then I want to say, uh, I'm so encouraged to see so many people out here interested in what's happening with education in the area. I think the conversation is as critical today as it possibly could be. And I think we all feel like there is change afoot and we all want to be part of it. So I'm so grateful for all of you turning out tonight. I'm certainly glad the snow decided it wouldn't come around and slow us down. And it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce a friend who went into the legislature with me 10 years ago, who is a career educator, who knows from the classroom out exactly what it's like to be an educator and to be changing the lives of young people in Maine and for the future. Our Commissioner of Education, Steve Bowen. Steve, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Chris, I think you and I first met, I think it was right here at the Senate, uh, when both of us were contemplating a run for the legislature. And it seems to me we wandered someplace in this facility and enjoyed a beer and tried to talk each other out of it. And I think it did work. Um, I'm really, uh, really thankful to be here, and thank you for coming out. Just as Chris said, I mean, this is great to have a, a big crowd um, out tonight to sort of talk about some of these issues. Uh, and what I thought I'd do is sort of do a kind of 10,000-foot view of this and how this fits into some of our thinking uh, in the department and where we sort of see uh, some of this going and what we see the role of the department being um, in, in ways that we can support the decisions that local school districts make about how they want to do some of these things. So I have up here... Uh, the, the title I put on this presentation tonight is Christian Based Learning Education 4.0. And Don Savisky, who's been doing some of this work with us, and I've got this joke that every time we do this, the number goes up a little bit more because we keep thinking of sort of different ways to segment and look at this. But I want to back up and sort of give us a sense of, talk a little bit about how we see this fitting into the direction that education's been going for many, many, many years. So to my way of thinking, this is Education 1.0. Um, and this is education as we knew it here um, generations ago. Not that many generations ago, I hate to add. The sort of one-room schoolhouse model. Uh, if my father was here tonight, who grew up in Hamden, uh, he would tell you, well, he would tell you at great length and with sort of epic proportions the story of his one-room schoolhouse uh, education, uh, which he had in Hamden until the third grade. Uh, and this, this school has taken on sort of biblical proportions in the family history here. Um, it was a school not unlike this one, I would imagine a little bigger, I've seen the building. Uh, had no electricity, 
had no indoor plumbing, had a two-holder out back, however, so that was pretty advanced for the day. Um, the wood stove, you know, the, the dads came in and got the stove running and chopped the wood. The moms came in at lunchtime and brought the, the lunch. The, um, uh, the woman that was the teacher milked her cows before she came to work in the morning. And, you know, this sort of a great long story about this school. But it was kids in that neighborhood of all different ages. That's what always floors me about these pictures, these old pictures. That these are kids, all kinds of different ages of kids, but all put into the same facility together with an individualized learning plan for each of those kids, because those teachers had groups of kids from all different grade levels in those schools. Um, my father will tell you that the, the most traumatic experience of his childhood was the closure uh, of his one-room schoolhouse when he was in third grade at the construction of the consolidated school, which still remains down in the middle of Hampton. Uh, and the school was closed, and he was put on a bus to go down. And of course, now remember, this was a modern school. There was indoor plumbing. There was electricity, there was water fountains science labs. And yet to him, this was a tremendously traumatic experience because he left behind the people he knew to some degree, the community he knew, the kids he knew. They were put on buses and they were taken to this consolidated school and, and nothing good resulted from that in his estimation. Um, and so that really is the education 2.0. When we, after the war, after the Second World War, we came back and decided that we needed to replace these, these sort of one-room schoolhouses and move to more of these consolidated school models. This is my alma mater, uh, Penobscot Elementary School up in Penobscot, Maine. Now, when I was there, uh, this addition down here was not put on. The building ended right there. That was all put on because somebody uh, made the mistaken determination that we were going to continue to expand enrollment in Penobscot. We were going to run out of space in the old part of the school. Uh, and they built a new addition, and subsequently to that, the enrollment dropped off. And now they've got about 60 kids in this building where there were 140 when I was there. Um, but this was the idea. And this building, when it was built in the late 50s, replaced the one-room schoolhouses around Penobscot. So this was kind of an education 2.0, that we were going to professionalize this industry, that we were going to build schools, that we were going to hire teachers who had been trained specifically that, we were going to have trained uh, uh, administrators who were going to run the schools, that we were going to have curriculum that was well designed, that we were going to have sort of standardized textbooks and things like that, that we were going to have science labs, that we were going to sort of take this into a new era, this system of schooling. And that's the system of schooling that we had. And when Sputnik was launched, you had this big push on science and math, and so the school system sort of absorbed that. When we got into the 60s and 70s, there was concern about making sure that we had equal access uh, to school for everybody, including students with disabilities. Schools adapted to that and took on the special ed uh, responsibilities. And so the schools have sort of operated under that uh, model for a number of years. Where we, but we had made a change. We took those small community-based schools, and we built, and this isn't a big school, we built much larger schools, and we put kids into these age-based grade levels. And we had first grade and second grade, which were all these kids, and we grouped them by the day they were born. That was the organizing principle of these schools. Kids born between this date and this date were put in the same room together, uh, and they remained with that same class of kids all the way through. Sure enough, uh, I wanted to paint you by showing you my school photos from back when I was at Thompson Elementary School. You would see each year, the same group of kids, the same class, year in and year out, as we moved up through that system uh, in lockstep. And that's the system that we've had uh, for some time. The issue is that eventually we got to the point where people were concerned that that system wasn't getting the job done. And most of you are familiar with this report, uh, the education reform report that came out in the early 1980s, the Nation at Risk. This was this, this big blue ribbon report that came out and expressed a tremendous amount of concern about the American educational system as it compared to systems around the world. And there was all this concern that we were entering this era of international competition, and the Russians, and the Japanese, and the Germans, and, and today it's now uh, India and China, that we weren't going to be able to compete. Uh, it had this very famous line about how this had been the education system that had been imposed on the country by an occupying force to be an act of war and all of this. So all of a sudden, the nation sort of in the 80s and 90s decided, wait a second, this isn't we're not getting kind of performance out of these schools that we think we should. Kids aren't doing well enough. Something has to change. And things don't happen quickly in education reform, but eventually things did. And we moved to this sort of education 3.0 model, which we probably should, we would characterize as kind of the accountability, uh, assessment accountability age, if you want to think of it in those terms. So what we started doing in response to uh, these reports that, that uh, talked about the concern with our education systems, we did two things. We adopted standards, learning standards. All the states put a set of learning standards in. 
so instead of each of those schools determining for themselves what they were going to teach and when and at what time and to what degree, we would have a set of standards that we would operate on. So that all first graders would be taught this, all second graders would be taught this, all the social studies, these are the things that would be taught in social studies and so forth. And Maine constructed its learning standards, the learning results, which are still in law. And we put those standards in place in all states. And then, beginning with No Child Left Behind, we started testing it. Uh, and that's the, the little sheet here that all of us are familiar with and our kids are familiar with. And we decided that what we'll do is we'll have these rigorous academic standards. And then we'll hold schools and, and teachers to account uh, for those standards. And so what we'll do is we'll test against the standards. Each state took its standards and then had to build an, a set of uh, uh, assessments to judge whether students had met those standards or not. Uh, and then under No Child Behind, we had to publicize that. We put those scores in the newspaper. Uh, and the thinking was that because we did this, we would sort of shame the schools into taking steps that they hadn't taken before. So we'll take your test scores, we'll put them in the newspaper. And the thinking was, you will do something about it. Um, and some part of the thinking was, you know what to do about it, but you are not doing it, but we'll make you do it because we'll shame you into doing it. So we went down this, this, this path, which we are still on of this sort of very heavy degree of assessment, lots of testing with kids, and all these accountability provisions. And this is still the system that we live under today. Uh, and earlier this week, I was down in Washington with the other um, state commissioners of education. Uh, we were having a little uh, uh, polite, I would say, visit with Secretary Duncan, uh, uh, SJ Secretary Duncan, talking to him about No Child Left Behind and the opportunities that we as state leaders would like to have to get some flexibility under that law. He's offered some. We debated on whether that was enough or not. Uh, it was a good, healthy debate with him. Uh, but we said this system is not working. Uh, you know, we've tried this for a number of years. And what we're seeing uh, is nothing that we really ought to be probably thrilled about. This is, uh, you can find this document on uh, the, the United States Department of Education's website. This is score, uh, scores on the NAEP test. National Assessment of Educational Progress is done by the United States Department of Education's research office. Uh, this test is done in every state in the nation. It's done in a randomized setting. Not every school does the NAEP. They pick schools sort of randomly to do it. So it's a good snapshot, a randomized snapshot of how kids are doing across the country. It's really the only assessment instrument we have that compares one state to the next uh, and compares over time. We've been doing this test for a number of years. And so we're able to discern some trends from this. Uh, and what you're seeing here in this, this is eighth grade reading, is you'll see that in 1998, uh, well before uh, No Child Behind was passed, you saw where our scores were relative to reading, and those are the scores on the actual exam. And then you see the trend line moving forward uh, into, well into the year of No Child Behind, with all of the testing, and all of the accountability provisions, and all of the scores in the newspaper, and all of the turmoil that No Child Behind has caused our educators, and you see that the scores in Maine at least, and largely in the nation, although the nation is closing the gap on us slightly, uh, is flat. In other words, this very heavy-handed push on accountability from the federal government has had virtually no effect uh, on these test scores. We've seen it slightly different in math. Math is up. This is eighth grade math. Um, so you see these scores are up still, but really only marginal. I mean, you're really not seeing a tremendous amount of growth. This goes back to 2000, uh, again, back right before No Child Left Behind was put into place. These scores are relatively flat. Again, the nation is closing the gap on us to some degree, although the scores in the letter are not too bad. Uh, and again, this doesn't, these scores don't tell you a whole lot. This is the piece that's important up here. Uh, the NAEP score establishes to what degree students are at or above proficient in these certain indicators. And this is this year's score for 2011, eighth grade math for Maine, 39% of our eighth graders are at or above proficient in eighth grade math, 39%. And if I could back up to reading, it's 38%. That's today, that's today's current scores, okay? So we're hovering, and as you can see, very little growth, despite all these efforts over the last few years, very little growth here, um, hovering around that 40% mark of kids that are at or above proficient on these scores. So this tremendous effort that we've put in uh, to these accountability systems and this testing for kids uh, really has not had a great deal of effect. Um, and you can see the same if you looked at the SAT scores, which we use for our 11th grade test, or even the 4th grade scores. 4th grade reading, our scores are actually below where they were 20 years ago. Uh, and this is despite a tremendous amount of work uh, uh, by all of our educators. Uh, and those of you who are educators and have been in schools, you know the work that we've done 
around the curriculum, the work that we've done around RTI, the work that we've done to try and address these, these kids, and something is simply not clicking here. Uh, because despite these efforts, we're just not moving the needle. And this isn't the only way to indicate what a kid's doing well. Obviously, it's a single test, and there are other things we need to look at. But this certainly indicates that if we're trying to get some more academic achievement and higher level academic achievement out of our kids, something's not working. So that brings us to, oh, and let me explain why I think that might be before I get to where we're going. I think we have a number of issues we need to confront, and we can talk about some of those later. Um, I think the problem that we have is not that our educators aren't doing what they need to do, not that they don't know what to do, or that they're not working hard. We know that they are, and all our education leaders and our school boards are doing everything they know to do to try and get these kids where they need to be. I think the problem that we have is an architecture problem. Uh, it's a design problem. Uh, the schools that we have were simply designed in their basic operating procedures for an era that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and I think what we're doing is we are beating our educators to death, trying to get them to make a system do something that it was not designed to do. The system that we have, by the way, was designed to a large degree by these people, uh, the so-called Committee of Ten, who produced this report. This was done by the National Education Association back in the last century. Uh, so this big uh, blue ribbon panel is chaired by the president of Harvard. It was this huge study specifically around secondary school studies, how to prepare students uh, for a world beyond secondary school. Secondary school was a relatively new invention in those days, and there was some thinking about how, what is high school, what should it look like, and what should it do. And so this report was put together uh, and uh, released and, and got all kinds of good feedback. Um, but it really did put into place most of the architecture of the system that we have today, uh, the age-based grade level model, the way we organize instruction, uh, this was the, the system that said how we should do mathematics is arithmetic up until about seventh or eighth grade, we should do pre-algebra and then do algebra. This was the group that said when you do uh, secondary school science that you start with earth science and then you do chemistry and then you do physics. Um, and this really outlined the basic curriculum uh, that we have almost to this day. And this is a particularly interesting piece that I found as I sort of trudged my way through this report. Um, this is a quote, each subject which is taught at all should be taught in the same way and to the same extent to every pupil. Because this question confronted this group, who is going to get this education and who should get it and should everybody get it or some people? And what they came to conclude was, well, everybody needs to know the sciences, and everybody needs to know the social studies, and if we're going to do this fairly, and we're going to be fair to the subject matter, we don't want to give preference to some content areas and not others. And so we're going to teach all of these different content areas, and we're going to teach them all the same way and the same extent to every pupil. So this really establishes this kind of model, this standardized model, where we're going to run what is more or less a factory style system where we're going to group kids by age. We're going to do a batch processing system. We're going to put the kids in batches based on their physical age. We're going to put the knowledge in batches. Okay, science is one batch, math is another batch. And we're going to set up a system to do batch processing. We're going to move the kids through the system and they're going to go to algebra first thing in the morning. Are they ready to learn algebra at 10 past 8 in the morning? It doesn't really matter because that's how we're going to run the system. So they're going to do math when it's time to do the math batch, and then they're going to go, and they're going to do that for 60 minutes or 58 minutes or 82 minutes or however long it is, whether they need more time or less. And then they're going to pick up all their stuff, uh, and then the bell will ring, and then they'll go and do the science batch. And the science batch will be disconnected from the math batch, and it'll be a whole different person will do that in a different way. And when they're done with that batch, the bell will ring, and they'll get up, and then we'll do language arts, and they'll go read Lord of the Flies or something, which is disconnected from the other two things that they just did. And then they'll have the gym batch, and they'll go swing from ropes to the ceiling of the gym. And, you know, I mean, it's just this, when you back up and think about it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And yet, this is the system all of us sort of went through. I certainly did. Uh, we sort of think of school in those terms, with bells ringing and fixed class periods. I mean, that's, that's school as we've conceived it. And being in an age-based grade level with other kids your age and going through this system. And that's just kind of how we have it. Uh, and I think what we're finding people beginning to realize, and, and certainly the districts that you're going to hear from later today who are doing this work, realize that I, this architecture doesn't really do enough to reach the needs of all of these kids. And when you read this, you realize it wasn't designed to do it. 
because these people were trying to solve a different kind of problem than we were trying to solve. What they were trying to solve is they understood that you weren't going to have more than 10, 15, 20 percent of the kids ever go to college. And so you didn't need to build a system that was going to reach all of those kids. You needed to build a system that could reach some of those kids. And the rest of those kids were going to go and work in a mill, or they were going to work in the woods, or they were going to work on the water, or they were going to work in a factory someplace. And they didn't need a high level of education. So we built a system, this sort of industrial kind of model, that met the needs of a lot of kids. And, and you know, figured out a way for a lot of kids to go on and get college education, post secondary education. And the other kids who were going to work at the mill or work on the farms, I grew up in a dairy farm in Hancock County, they got a rudimentary education that they needed, and all of that was fine. And maybe that did serve our needs for years and years and years. But the challenge we have now is this system was not designed to get every single student to a high level of achievement on rigorous international benchmarks, academic standards. And that's what we have to have. And this system was not designed to do that. 